Can you see all the vulnerabilities that a hacker sees? Here is a set UID root C program. How would you crack it to get a root shell? Here's another. Again, could you get a root shell from it? If you can demonstrate successful attacks on your Linux VM, you may skip this lecture and move on to the next one. Otherwise, welcome to Frank Stajano Explains. I am Professor of Security and Privacy at the University of Cambridge, and this is my second year undergraduate course in security. Today's topic is understanding that the attack surface of a program might be much larger than you think, and that there are several ways that SetUID programs can be exploited for privilege escalation. For today's topic, you must fire up your seed virtual machine that I mentioned in the first lecture and complete at least tasks 6, 7 and 8 in the environment variable and set UID lab. You'll want to refer to chapters 1 and 2 in the course textbook, but the material in chapter 2 is not examinable. So let's talk about attack surface and privilege escalation. This is an OWASP definition. The attack surface describes all of the different points where an attacker could get into a system and where they could get data out. Privilege escalation, as we said in previous lecture, as you can find up there, is where you, as the attacker, gain greater privileges than you are supposed to have, typically by exploiting a vulnerability of a set UID root program. First start, since they are potentially dangerous, can you find all the set UID root programs that exist now on your computer? Can you do that for me now? There is a versatile program we already used in a previous lecture called appropriately find, which can solve this problem with a one-liner if you invoke it with the right combination of options. I'll leave it to you to read its rather messy man page and discover these options, but let me tell you that it has options to find things that are actual files as opposed to directories or symbolic links or other things. It has options to find files that match certain permissions, and you want the ones with a set UIB set your ID bit set, of course, and also to find files that have a certain owner and you want the ones where the owner is root or uh, UID zero. So search the man page for all these things, put together a command line and then run it on your system. Before doing that, stop and think, how many programs can you name that you expect to be set your ID root? And why do they have to be set your ID root? As you do that, a somewhat obscure program you will find is user bin chsh. What does it do? It lets the user change her login shell. Ch means change shell. Why does this program have to be set UID root? Well, where is the information stored about which shell the user uses? It's in the etc. password file. This is a system-wide, world-readable, but owned by root file and writable only by root that contains one line for each account in the system. Each line has seven fields separated by colons. And these fields are the username, the password hash, and if that's an X instead of a real password hash, it means that the password hash is actually stored in a separate file called etc. shadow, for reasons that we'll explain in detail in another lecture. Uh, then the third field is the user ID, then the group ID, the comment field, the home directory of the user, and finally, in the seventh field, the login shell that they use. So to change the login shell, you must change the last field in your line in that file that file which is owned by root and only writable by root. And it's only writable by root, otherwise you, you could change the accounts of other users. Uh, but we want users to be able to change their login shell in a kind of self-service fashion, because it would be a pain for the system administrator to have to be involved every single time that this happens. So this is why uh, user being chsh is a set UID root program. It allows write access to that privileged file, etc. password, but only in a restricted way. Now, what is the attack surface of chsh? Clearly, it includes the input that the user is supposed to supply, namely the string with the path of the new shell. Now, can you imagine a way of doing privilege escalation by supplying a maliciously crafted input to chsh? And I'll give you a hint. Can you use chsh to add an entry for a new user into etc. password? Think about it. Well, Chsh will write to the last field in the line. It will replace the last field in the line with a string that you supply. In C, a string is terminated by a null byte. And what if before this uh, uh, terminating null byte, your string contained a new line character somewhere? Then, uh, when replacing the last field of your line 
your line in the etc password with the string that you supply, then Cheshire would end up writing another line into the file after your line. And you could write anything you wanted into that line as the attacker. You could select the username, even select the password, because uh, although the system lets you use etc shadow for extra security, uh, in fact, for backwards compatibility, it doesn't prevent you from having the hash password in etc password, as opposed to farming it out to etc shadow. So you could even enter password in there. And of course, you could select a UID of zero, which would make your new entry a root account. So there you go. This vulnerability actually existed in Cheshire originally. And uh, to fix it, uh, as the programmer of Cheshire, you must sanitize the input before using it. After this attack has been shown to you, then you could decide, OK, I will filter out any new lines in the input. But who knows what else you haven't thought about. So the current implementation of Cheshire is a bit more prudent than that, and that's a good thing. And it only allows the options that are already whitelisted in the file, etc. shells. And you can't change your shell to anything else that is not one of the few options that are present in that file. So talking of attack surface, the command line parameters are the most evident portion of the attack surface of a command line program. Now the program we have here does not take any command line arguments. It's a pretty pointless demo program that runs a system utility as set UID without taking any arguments. Okay, why does it do that? Well, we'll leave that for another time. The example is slightly contrived, but what is the attack surface of this program? Well, a less obvious form of input that this program takes is the environment variables that change the behavior of the program. For example, the path environment variable tells the shell where to look for files that it is asked to execute. And in this case, by placing a directory she can write to at the front of her path, then attacker Alice can execute any file she wants by copying it in that directory under the name ls, because ls is what this program is going to execute, but it doesn't say where from. So it will look for it in the path. So she can use this to get herself a root shell. This is an instance of privilege escalation by manipulating an environment variable, which is an indirect input to our target program. It's not something we supplied on the command line. One way to prevent this attack is for the programmer to specify a full absolute path for the executable to be launched. So this is the countermeasure that is adopted in this other example program. Again, this is a rather contrived demo. The story might be that this is a viewer that lets you display the content of any file on the system, if you, if you make this program set your D root, uh, even those that you could not view with your regular privileges. So uh, you can't view etc. shadow uh, on your own, but you can if you do it through this program. It's not a particularly good idea to offer this facility because there was a reason why the unprivileged user was not allowed to read all files. But let's suspend this belief for a moment and let's see instead if there are ways to escalate privileges and do more than just reading all files, which this program is uh, intentionally granting you as a privilege. So can you from that instead take over the system completely? Well, an absolute path for the executable is supplied this time, and this defeats the previous attack of manipulating the path. However, since the setuid root program invokes system, which is a system call that accepts a string containing the program and its command line parameters, and then executes this string by invoking the shell init, which will parse it from first principles, then our devious attacker Alice will supply a command line parameter that contains besides some dumb initial parameter to uh, to keep cat happy a statement terminating semicolon and then a new command of her choosing for example bin sure which will give her a root shell and make her all powerful so this is another example of privilege escalation through an unsanitized command line parameter to defeat this attack the programmer should avoid the system function altogether, which is convenient but highly insecure. And instead, uh, the programmer should use a function from the execv family, which clearly separates the command to be executed from its arguments. Now, this is a theme that will recur 
again and again in this course. When you as a programmer accept user input that is supposed to be data, then you have to be doubly and triply sure that it will only be treated as data and that there is no way that it will be promoted to being interpreted as a command. An incredible variety of attacks uh, take place because ingenious attackers manage to persuade the system to interpret data as commands. Environment variables form a particularly insidious portion of the attack surface of the program because it's very easy to overlook them as an input. They're often not even mentioned in the documentation of the SETUID program we are examining because they are in fact system level facilities rather than features of that specific program. They were not introduced by the author of the program, uh, even though they affect it. Now, everyone who uses the command line is familiar with the path environment variable that we mentioned earlier, but that's not the only variable that influences the behavior of an executable. There are more obscure ones that are little known outside the realm of C developers. For example, the ones that control dynamic linking. Well, what is dynamic linking in the first place? Your program calls library functions. With static linking, both the code you wrote and the code of the library functions you call is linked into a static executable. If you write 10 programs that call these functions, their code is replicated 10 times into the statically compiled executables, taking up more space. Also, if one of the library functions is updated, for example, to fix a bug, maybe to patch a security vulnerability, then all your executables still contain the flawed version of the library function until they are recompiled and relinked against the new one. For this reason, the default behavior, if you don't tell the compiler to do otherwise, is instead to link libraries dynamically. Then you don't have multiple copies of the object code uh, of the library functions, and you always pick up the latest version installed on the system. What some people might not know is that there are environment variables that let you manipulate the behavior of the dynamic linker. LD library path is a bit like path, but for searching dynamic libraries to be loaded, whereas LD preload specifies a list of libraries that will be loaded first, whether the program requests them or not. These facilities are commonly used to supply an alternative version of a function that's instrumented for debugging, without having to recompile the executable that you want to debug. Clearly, this allows you to substitute arbitrary code instead of the code of the original program, and for this reason, LD library path and LD preload are ignored by the system if the effective user ID is not the same as the real user ID to avoid the obvious privilege escalation vulnerability. You will be doing an exercise as part of your seed lab today in which you will replace a library function with your own function, and you will check in which cases the substitution actually takes place and in which cases it doesn't. However, the feature interaction can be complex, and even though system programmers have thought about the potential for this facility to open up security holes and have tried to prevent it, they have nonetheless been caught out. Here's a related incident. In uh, Apple OS X 10.10, .10, released in 2014, Apple introduced an environment variable called the dyld print to file that allowed the developer to specify a file to which the dynamic linker, that's dyld, uh, would output its debugging information. So the baseline vulnerability here is that uh, it allowed a malicious actor to force a setuid root program to write a protected system file such as etc password. Although the attacker would not be able to choose what to write in it so it wasn't such a big deal. I mean, this could lead to denial of service by corrupting crucial files, but it was hard to turn it into a privileged escalation exploit. Unfortunately, another mistake was also made. When the SetUID root program dropped its privileges, it did not close its open file descriptors, meaning that a careful attacker could still write to the open file that he had specified with that variable under root privileges. Now that was quite disastrous, and indeed it allowed the attacker to escalate privileges by writing into protected system files. Indeed, an exploit was found in the wild that modified uh, the file, etc., sudoers, which uh, would give the attacker the right to uh, run anything as root without entering a password. One way of patching this vulnerability is to sanitize the environment variable before using it so as to disable writing to system files but you have to be extra careful because the attacker might have linked one of their files to a system file and 
are you sure you're going to detect that by sanitizing? The safer approach is, as we said earlier, not to honor the redirection at all for SETI-ID programs. What I'm just about to say is optional and not examinable, but the keenest among you might also wish to figure out how to do privilege escalation on SETI-ID scripts, scripts being defined as executables that start with the hash bling, uh, and that therefore call some kind of interpreter, uh, from Binture to Python to whatever else. And you should understand why the scripts are more vulnerable than compiled programs, uh, and why, in fact, most modern versions of Unix ignore the set UID bit on scripts. I want you to figure out why. So the main thing to remember is that any place through which your program accepts input from the user, even if it's very hidden, like that uh, dild print to file uh, environment variable, is part of your attack surface. And you should check it thoroughly for vulnerabilities, and particularly for the possibility that the foreign input might be upgraded from data to a command. Attackers can do amazing things by feeding your program inputs that you did not expect. In fact, the eagle-eyed among you will have spotted another exploitable vulnerability in the democat program, which I'm going to talk about in this other video, which will be out soon if it isn't already. Buffer overflow, the best known software security vulnerability, and yet still one of the most common. Thank you very much for watching, have fun completing your seed lab, and I'll see you in the next lecture.